I've kind of talked too long, um, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce a good friend of mine and uh, a uh, man who is always where he needs to be. Um, Zach Urbina, uh, I ran into him at a party several years ago like two years ago and you know he, he you know Simone introduced me to him and said hey this that guy kind of like space and this Claude guy kind of like space why don't I talk about it and um, since then um, every single space thing I've been to this guy's been at and uh, he's gonna tell you why he's got some interesting ideas thank you Clive I need a yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, actually, we can. Um, okay. there's, there's an audio thing that's hanging off of this thing. Okay. Just a couple quick seconds. Woo! Sacramento! What's up, Doug? How you doing? Good, thanks. Don't have your check after the show. Well, well, well. Yeah, my goal is to get the talk uh, under 15 to 20 minutes, and uh, if I go over and you happen to bring eggs and tomatoes, uh, feel free to test your throwing arm for accuracy. All right, um, what kind of pork do you have on that? I got a cereal guy, and then if there's any audio, I have a video at the end. We change inputs on this thing, I think. All right, yeah. Actually, I'm not going to, I prefer no microphone. I intend to project that, sure. Thank you, Blood. Okay, so, um, yeah, um, this is an updated talk of a talk that I gave at the Future Salon. Um, I guess it was in December. Um, let's see, it's maybe Gary, or a couple of you might have been here. Um, <laughs> So I apologize if this is new, but I'm going to hopefully give a nice compressed version of it. Uh, let's go to... Okay, so um, I'm interested in um, electrodynamic tethers, and with a couple of colleagues, I've written proposals on um, electrodynamic tethers, uh, and, and it's kind of an odd technology, so I want to do like a quick demonstration. You know, long before people were actually flying actual rockets, like both uh, on the ground and then up into orbit, uh, we had a sense in the popular imagination of what rockets were, like there was like Flash Gordon, and, and like both movies like uh, Journey to the Moon, uh, Voyage to the Moon, I should say, and um, we had a sense of what rockets were, but electrodynamic tether technology is very strange. And so uh, I have something here that I'm going to use just as kind of a demonstrator. So um, my good friend Mike, I'm going to use my guinea pig. So basically, an electrodynamic tether has a length of wire. And on one end of that wire is a bare wire anode, a negatively biased bare wire anode, and a hollow cathode emitter on the other end. And if you deploy this particular wire in low Earth orbit, low Earth orbit basically where the electron-rich parts of it are between um, Basically, it's starting around 100 kilometers, and it's about, depending on where you are uh, on the planet, it's between uh, 30 kilometers and 600 kilometers thick. Uh, you can run this wire in the, uh, in the plasma and utilize the free-floating electrons and run current along it. Now, that doesn't really buy you anything if it's just a wire, but if this wire happened to be attached to, say, for example, the International Space Station or near when that was still up in orbit, you could actually do something with it. Now, what you can do is buy delta V. You can maneuver your spacecraft using no propeller, so that's it for it. So that's kind of what I'm talking about. It's more or less, like, thank you. It's more or less a giant wire, and uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about a couple of missions. So like I said before, well, they only work in low Earth orbit in the electron-rich parts uh, of the atmosphere, and in that part of, uh, of the upper atmosphere, you have uh, monomolecular oxygen and free-floating electrons. So basically, at a certain point in time, that wire will start to degrade, and so anything that you put up there that might utilize electrodynamic tether technology, you have to kind of get rid of it after about five years. That um, atomic oxygen or monomolecular oxygen will start to break it down. Do you speak up? Oh, I guess I'll use the microphone, yeah, sorry. More confidence. A lot of noise out there. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, the way we got interested in this is that a colleague of mine, Solo Good? Better. Yeah, better. Uh, okay. 
Um, a colleague of mine, uh, an, um, an electrical engineer, is also happened to be uh, very interested in patents. And so we got interested in orbital debris in 2010. Uh, and he started to do some digging, and we found out a lot of interesting information uh, about a couple of missions that have run um, through the Naval Research Lab. One of these missions is called SEDS-2. Uh, SEDS stands for Small Expendable Deployer. Basically, it was a 20 kilometer long tether that was launched by NRL, Naval Research Lab, in 1994. Uh, and it basically deployed, uh, it extended from two different ends, and uh, ran up in low Earth orbit. Joe Carroll helped design the system. He's become, over time, something of a mentor of mine, and we've collaborated on a couple of papers since. Um, I guess maybe to give you a better sense of what these things look like, I'm going to show a quick video. And this, as you can see by the time and date, stamp flew in the mid-90s. And uh, that's up in low Earth orbit, and it's, you can tell from the ground, that's not like a very sophisticated camera, so you could have seen this tether system from the ground uh, if you happen to be looking up at the right point in time in the sky at the right time of day, uh, or night, I should say. That's 20 kilometers long. It's glowing because uh, there's current running through it. Uh, the onboard batteries died on SEDS-2, and unfortunately, because the cost to get something like this up and deployed in LEO uh, is so long and so expensive, the technological development, the iterations of it, are kind of moving slowly. Um, there's another mission that's going to be flying called TEPSI that's actually scheduled to fly on a future Dragon mission. I'm not sure when exactly, uh, depending on uh, SpaceX's schedule. Um, but that will be kind of the next version of that. It's a triple cube sat, it extends in the center, and there's a two kilometer long um, wire running between the center of it. And that's the next version of electrodynamic tether technology. Um, tethers, you can see, have been flowing, uh, flying for a long period of time, uh, more or less since Gemini 11, uh, different iterations of that. But electrodynamic tethers, as we know them today, that utilize current and free floating plasma are more or less maybe 15 years old, give or take. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this, but I want to kind of plow through it because I don't want to spend too much time. So SDS-75 is like the famous tether mission that everybody kind of at least has a sense of. Dr. Franklin Chang Diaz, who's a very famous uh, astronaut now working on something called uh, Vasimir, uh, he was involved in that. Um, there were some false assumptions about what was going on on SDS-75. Supposedly, uh, they were researching sex positions in space. That's actually not true. Uh, supposedly there was also a UFO sighting. I know, I'm very disappointed to a lot of folks. Um, supposedly there was also a UFO sighting on board or out of focus orbital debris, depending on who you ask. Um, what is true is that um, there was the first use of Linux OS on orbit. Um, and those of you who are, you know, computer science geeks out there might appreciate that. Um, the primary payload was a 20 kilometer long electrodynamic tether um, deployer, and that actually broke at about 19 clicks. And unfortunately, that's kind of the story of a lot of this stuff. Um, the research says basically that you can get, for, for every one kilometer of tether that you have extended, you, you can collect about 200, you can run about 200 volts through it. But because the distribution, the um, density of electrons is so different depending on where you are in orbit, um, you can burn these tethers up very quickly. In fact, several of them have burned up and, and it's not, that's why when people look at tether technology with a kind of skeptical eye because the, the tech that has been developed hasn't been developed at a very steady pace. Uh, and so we hope to change that. In fact, if SpaceX allows regular access sometime down the road, or some of our so horrible reusable launch providers um, maybe have potentially on their payloads a second stage to orbit, like a sounding rocket to orbit, maybe we could develop this technology a little bit more uh, rapidly. And that's kind of what uh, I'm very interested in. And so like guys like Xcore, um, certainly uh, Scale Composites and Virgin, we're very curious to see what they do. So if we can get, if we can get tethers up there more regularly, we can develop them more completely, and maybe take better advantage of this kind of technology. Um, so some of these applications for tethers, um, that's kind of what I want to get into. So it's not just like this weird science project, which is what a lot of this has been. It is potentially something that could do very real good. Um, the messy business over here uh, is the, um, the Chinese ASAT test that happened uh, in 2007. So basically the Chinese, um, to test out a particular weapon technology, they wanted to destroy one of their own aging weather satellites. So they did that. And unfortunately, it propagated debris all over LEO. And now, like, the ISS is to regularly uh, maneuver to get out of the way of this debris. Um, also, for aging satellites, you potentially take something down using a tether. And so that's another thing. Like, the Iridium uh, Cosmos collision, if you're familiar with that, happened in 2009. Uh, they were two, it was an active satellite, Iridium, those global phones, uh, and then an aging Soviet era satellite. And uh, these two guys collided. And if, if Cosmos were to have utilized electrodynamic tether technology, potentially augment drag and pull it down back to Earth in a controlled re-entry or boost it up out of the way into like a graveyard orbit. Uh, and that's where I see uh, tether technology being utilized the best. Um, I guess 
No, I was hoping maybe Rick Clemenson would be here, but I don't see him. Um, so, New Space kind of started with this company called Miracorp. It was a group of guys led by Walt Anderson who were going to like buy and potentially lease the uh, the Mir space station. Uh, Mir was had been up there for about, I guess at the time, about 15 years, and its orbit was degrading, so they were going to abandon Mir. And Walt Anderson was kind of a space enthusiast. He got some money together and decided, hey, if we get some money together, they were going to buy it for like $20 million. We could potentially use Mir as like an on-orbit hotel. And, and that was what they had in mind. And um, unfortunately, the deal went sour. Um, that a lot of, for a lot of reasons, but it kind of paved the way um, for potentially uh, commercial customers to do business with government organizations to kind of advance interesting ambitions. And uh, there was uh, an electrodynamic tethered deployer system which was developed, uh, which was going to be uh, exported um, to Russia to then go up in like a Russian launch vehicle, but unfortunately it didn't happen. Uh, the State Department doesn't like it uh, if you try to act more quickly than they would like. And um, Unfortunately, the, uh, the tether system was eventually cleared to be exported on the day that the Russians officially decided to uh, deorbit and burn up Mir. So, this is kind of what happened, and Mir Corp never came to be. Some of that money changed hands, but unfortunately that was the end of that. But it kind of got the ball rolling with commercial space stuff, and uh, as much as Mir Corp was not successful, I think it was actually kind of a really cool thing, and, uh, and it paved the way for a lot of fun stuff. So, the reason why I got interested in tethers to begin with, is the orbital debris problem. And as you can see here, a lot of what comes down out of orbit does burn up, but if you have, for example, a titanium rocket motor, um, it will not burn up. And these three gentlemen here are kind of poking at something, there's probably not much to find in there. Um, but the idea is that certain things, when they come down, they don't burn up all the way. And so we've had three, in the last like year, we've had three big re-entry events. One was called URs, the Upper Atmosphere Research uh, Satellite. Another one, a German uh, space telescope called ROSAT. And uh, the Phobos grunt thing, the Phobos grunt thing is really unfortunate. That was a, uh, it was a sample return mission that was supposed to go to Phobos around Mars and, uh, and return back some samples. So all three of these events kind of point out the fact that we need to have some kind of active strategy in which we return or do pull some kind of control uh, re-entry on a lot of this debris. Um, Eddie is something that I'm a big fan of, and I want to talk a little bit about Eddie. Joe Carroll and, uh, and Jerome Pearson and uh, another few colleagues Develop something called Eddy, and Eddy basically are these smaller. It's hard to describe it as a vehicle. It's basically a wire that could that could wriggle up. Uh, they, they, the um, electrodynamic tethers tend to move across the field lines, uh, and so like they tend to kind of want to wrap because um, electrons wrap themselves around the, like, um, the magnetic field line, and so Eddy kind of wants to wrap itself around the field lines as well. But if you can maneuver these guys up and attach, for example, to um, old Soviet era rocket stages, you can either boost them up bring them down, or what I think a lot of people want to do, or at least a few ambitious people want to do, is gang them together. And the idea is, rather than spending hard-earned money, and rather than spending energy to bring this stuff down and burn it up, you potentially want to gang it together and start to recycle. There are 1,100 tons of either aerospace grade aluminum or aluminum alloy that's up there in LEO right now. And Potentially, I think people see that as an opportunity. Actually, that's why, pardon me, that's why I uh, originally got into orbital debris. I don't necessarily see it as just trash. I see it as actually a great opportunity. And um, there's been a lot of talk about maybe doing missions to uh, rendezvous with a uh, with an asteroid. I think a great practice one would be to rendezvous with a few pieces of very big orbital debris. Okay, so like I said before, the future of tether tech is kind of dependent on access, and right now access is tricky. Um, SpaceX, we look forward to their big launch coming up in April. I think there are a lot of people who are excited about that. Um, I wish you guys a lot of luck. Um, also, the suborbital providers, uh, I think, offer unique opportunities too. I think a, a second stage from a suborbital provider to uh, orbit would be a unique capability, and I've got a couple of projects that I'm working on right now which could potentially offer that capability, uh, depending on, of course, you guys' Uh, flight schedule, how things go, so. Pedaling as fast as I can. Good, good, that's beautiful. <laughs> also, too, uh, worth mentioning is the centennial challenge that NASA is doing. Um, I mentioned Paul Breed, and um, he has, I, I believe, he's developing a rocket right now which intends to participate in the NanoSat launch prize. Um, this is a really cool thing. So if you, as an amateur rocketeer, can develop a rocket that can go up to LEO two times in a week, 
you satisfy the conditions for the prize and you can claim the $2 million. Now, the money to me, the money's nice. Uh, all of these kind of prizes, you've had to spend a lot more to satisfy the prize than you get back. But I think a lot of people recognize it's the capability that you want. So like for me, if I were to like piece together a company that potentially could offer that capability, I would be much more interested in the rocket itself, in getting up to LEO, than I would be the actual money. I mean, money's nice, but having your own fleet of satellites would be very nice too. And uh, I mentioned before, TEPSI, um, these are star technology spacecraft, so uh, like I said before, we have a sense of what rockets are, we have a sense of like capsules, so like when we think about um, Falcon, we think about Dragon, like the Dragon capsule, it looks a lot like previous capsules, kind of looks like Gemini, kind of looks like uh, some of the Apollo spacecraft. Um, the spacecraft that you would use, utilizing, or that you would develop and deploy, utilizing uh, electrodynamic tether technology, don't really look like anything that we know. Um, they kind of look odd. Um, this guy right here, is TEPSI. Uh, TEPSI is an NRL project that will be going up on a Dragon, and um, those guys are like solar panels, and then you have a stacer in the center that breaks free, and two kilometers of tether uh, that deploy between the center, and uh, and that's your spacecraft. And um, we're kind of looking down the road a little bit and, and hoping that TEPSI will be successful. And if it is, um, my company, Cozy Dark, we just submitted three big proposals to NASA under the NIAC program. And uh, we have what we feel is like the next step beyond like TEPSI uh, of a modular platform, a modular satellite. So a spacecraft that you could maneuver utilizing no propellant that would have both space-facing and earth-facing modules that could be used for imaging or uh, collecting orbital debris or any number of capabilities. And kind of like how the NanoRacks program on ISS offers unique research and unique capability opportunities for uh, either academics or, or technically involved people. Um, we feel that our, we're calling it StarCub, we feel that StarCub could offer similar kinds of capabilities in LEO. Um, and that's another thing, this kind of tech only works in LEO. So as I said before, we're hoping for um, further iterative development of the technology. Um, Reboost uh, is one opportunity, but I kind of want to show off the spacecraft. That's kind of what this is all about. I gave this talk a month ago, no, two months ago now, and uh, the only thing that's really changed is what we've developed. So I'm going to show this off. Um, other than NIAC, nobody's seen this, except for a company in Italy that put it together the visualization, obviously. And I'm really proud of this, and I want to show it, so hopefully, let's share it the same. And uh, the volume knob is turned up. Okay. A little help? Yep. Alright, uh, go ahead and plug the mic something with the sound. Yep. It's not plugged in here. Plug in the wrong hole. There you go. Okay, good play. Thank you. <laughs> We propose a medium-term disposable spacecraft as a new kind of modular platform. Twelve independent electrodynamic tethers provide delta V and low Earth orbit. The tethers remain coiled to prevent hazard to nearby satellites. Attitude control is managed via magnet torpors and heliostat-assisted solar arrays power onboard systems. Braided tape conducting tether allows StarCup to climb, descend, and or change orbit planes based on customer needs. Okay, so that's it. Um, <laughs> just do that. <laughs> Thank you. The whole, the whole idea of getting that out is so we could talk a little bit, and um, I always feel like opportunities like this are amazing because we've got brilliant people who do this professionally in the crowd, and um, and I live for the Q and A. So please, Richard, I see. So how do you? I'm not sure if anyone there. My neighbor here also does that. How does it move? Okay, so it's a it's a plasma in in the ionosphere. It's it's, it's like it's like free floating electrons. Okay, so it moves by. Okay, you deploy. Here, let me bring the guy back up. You deploy your tether a certain length, and, and see the Air Force doesn't like tethers because basically, like for example, like sets two, 
they look at that as being, like because it's 20 kilometers long, they look at that as a 20 kilometer long spacecraft. Okay, that raises your liability considerably. You can bump into anything, you can cause more trouble up there, ruckus, etc. Bad business for everyone. Um, what we are kind of looking at is if you can kind of pare down the, the ambitious elements of that tether system and divide that up. So you have instead of one giant tether, you have 12 tethers that pay out in kind of a coiled fashion. So like if you had a belt and you still cinched your belt really, really tight, if you then paid out length on that belt, you could kind of like pay out more and so you could potentially... The science behind the tethers, perhaps I, missed, I may have missed that. E cross B. Yeah, Maxwell's the equations. There you go. Yeah. You, have, you have a current running through a wire that you're... It's relatively simple, but what's complicated is that um, we don't know, like for example, what I want to build on the ground is like um, a, a facility that could potentially recreate orbital velocity in an electron rich environment. So basically like a vacuum chamber, a vacuum chamber, a thermal chamber, and like a really fast center view. Such a thing doesn't really exist, but that's the only way you're going to be able to develop that tech on the ground. Otherwise you have to send up stuff a lot. And like TEPC is great because that's the next step, but like I think that in between TEPC and whatever the last NASA project was, it was like 10 years or something like that. So like the steps forward, um, they don't happen as quickly as I would like, or as a lot of people would like. Is it possible to develop stepping stones of this technology by using suborbital vehicles? Right, well, okay, so that's something, right, okay, right now there's a suborbital solicitation that we just sent out a notice of intent to propose for. Um, what I would like to see happen, and this is dependent on a, a couple of companies out there, um, so if you have a suborbital vehicle that can take part of the way and you can develop uh, a second stage to orbit, then you could potentially do something for like a lot cheaper. I, I think the question was, can you do a useful tether experiment on a suborbital trajectory for just a few minutes? I don't think, my understanding is that the uh, density of electrons is not enough to, to kind of to boost up. And you also kind of need to go like fast to keep up with that orbital velocity. The other, yes. the other issue there is that people have tried to deploy scientific tethers on suborbital missions just to gather data, and there's real trouble getting them stably deployed in that short time scale. So you really want to spend hours deploying getting this thing tether. deployed and stable before you start trying to do anything useful to it. I agree. It, the deployers, actually, we uh, submitted an SBIR just on deployers because the deployers have been a real problem. And yes. It's like if you wanted to pay out a, a line that was, you know, say you had a kite that was 20 kilometers long, I mean, the potential for any kind of hiccup in that paying out of the line is, is very real. There are issues. I have a long list of tether experiments. A lot of them are suborbital experiments where they deploy the tether and try and get it out in five minutes and snaps at the end because they're going too fast. I hear you. Um, we should talk. <laughs> <laughs> yes, in the back. Uh, how does the RS relate to current ion propulsion technology? Uh, I am unfamiliar with current ion propulsion technologies. Uh, I'm guessing it's that. It's not like the order of, I think, uh, uh, Say it again, please. It's on the order of no one Okay. Of thrust. Of thrust. Okay. Um, these guys move very, very, very slowly. Um, one of the reasons why um, you only, like, for example, I would want to test on an orbital debris is because there's no, like, like the debris is only going to sit there. So it takes me, if you can move, say, seven kilometers in one day, and it takes me a long time to both change orbit planes, to rendezvous with whatever it is I'm going after, um, that piece of that spent Soviet era rocket stage, it, it doesn't matter if it takes me a year, a month, ten years. Okay. It's not going any place. So, um, you know, my understanding is that solar sails and ion engines move a little more quickly and have a little bit more maneuverability. This is, it's not exactly a passive system, but it's like basically between a passive and active form of maneuverability. And so it, um, it'll take time. It moves very, very slowly. Yes? The way these systems produce thrust is by inducing a current based on presumably solar panels or something? Uh, well, to deploy it, you could, if you look at the, if you look at the patents, the, the, the deployer would could potentially have a thruster on it, you could potentially have uh, um, like, a, like a, a solar cell, I mean, there are a number of different ways to kind of get it out. I think it, uh, a, it has deployed, a... What's deployed, though? The, the way you would change orbital planes or boost altitude or something? It just, it's, like, it's like, you imagine, it, it's pulling, it, it, imagine, it's like, it's not like traditional thrust, it, it's like you're pulling through the ion-rich environment, like... I guess like maybe a magnet would be an analogy, but that's not the case. Because it's, it's a mine, you have to add power. Oh, sure, of course. No, and, and right. that's what I'm saying. This is not, this is not a transportation system. This is once you're up there, yes. and, and the argument that I've heard, which is an effective argument, is that you can't get something for nothing. Um, you do still have to spend money and thrust and, and everything else to get your resources to get you up there, is the point. Um, but once you're up there, is the point. And that's why I'm kind of looking forward, like uh, Will's talk is great, because he's looking at the next like, five years. If I'm looking at the next like 10 years, in about 10 years, if we can bring those that cost a little bit down, then you 
can change some of what you do once you're up there. And, and so I'm not talking about developing any kind of system to get you up there. I'm talking about what you do once you're in the orbit. What, what I'm wondering about is once you're in orbit, to the extent that you can use the system to raise your altitude or to change the plane, how much power does that take? Is it that comes from solar panels that are part of the system? Sure. How do you equate uh, square area of solar panels to the amount of thrust and effect you get trying to change orbit? Um, right, so right now I would be very interested to see what Tepsi does, um, because the stuff is still kind of new. Right now, because Tepsi is built to handle multiple um, multi-amperages as it's deployed, so we'll, we'll kind of see. Um, I, I would love to do more work on the ground before we send it up, but up until right now, these are just kind of science experiments, and, uh, and that's unfortunate. So, we'll see. Anybody else? Okay, yeah. who do we have next? Um, well, actually, we have, um, is there anybody on the list, Kyle? I'm taking a lunch time. All right, uh, well, um, I'm going to break the room, and the 